go ahead and then uh, continue. So today what I'm gonna do is I have an hour and a half. I, I'm assuming I will. you can ask questions along the way. I will be happy to answer questions uh, along the way. I will try to monitor my, uh, my, my chat as well here. I, and then also um, take, um, um, and then also ho hopefully have time for questions, including my uh, one that uh, you've already mentioned about how I managed to do engineering and then do communication. But I think that's part of what I'm also going to be talking about today. So hopefully it'll all be within that uh, context. Let me double check. Some. Here we go. Okay. So uh, the title of this talk is really long and somewhat confusing. And let's see if we can unpack it before we're all done. Reimagining theories and methods to understand and enable the algorithmically infused changing nature of work. So as you probably gathered that unlike some of the other illustrious speakers in your series, um, my focus in communication has tended to be at the organizational context and the work context. And so uh, it might be a little different from some of the other presentations that you have heard or will hear within this particular uh, series that you have. Um, so where do we start here? So where we start is by saying that technologies and the workplace have had a long tradition. I mean, in our field of communication, we think about technologies, a lot of it in the context of mass media and so on. But if you think about it in, the, in terms of the changing nature of work, we see that there has been a lot of developments that have happened starting in the 1990s. There were things like groupware, there were things like intranet, Yahoo was big in 1995. You got things like LinkedIn that came at the turn of the century, uh, online games, uh, social computing, uh, Mechanical Turk in 2005, 2000, and that's in point. Microsoft came out with what it's called SharePoint was in 2010, uh, which was their first effort to try to get into this business. Of course, then there was Office 365, there was clouding, um, and then there was crowdsourcing, which became a big issue. And then more recently, we have this thing called enterprise social media. In many ways, the workplace has lagged behind the public. When people began to see that you can have things like Facebook and Twitter to keep up with our social networks, then people thought, well, why don't we use some of these same tools in the workplace? And so they created what sometimes is referred to as enterprise social media, which is basically things like Slack, things like Zoom, things like Microsoft Teams, and they've just taken over. So if you look at this list here, these are all enterprise social media that have just mushroomed within the last uh, five to five to six, 10 years, I would say, is when most of this has really been mushrooming, et cetera. And so what is it about this that is different from what happened in the past? And one of the ways in which people in communication and in related fields have looked at this is to think about what is it that these technologies are, are affording us that was different from the old fashioned emails that we sent directly to people. And so what I want to do is touch briefly on some of what these affordances are. So they're called technological affordances of ESM. One of the things that enterprise social media does is it increases our ability to associate. It helps us reveal who knows who and who knows what. So think just for a minute about what you do with Twitter or with uh, Facebook or any uh, WhatsApp and things of that kind. What happens is that when you have these kinds of affordances, you have a better chance of knowing who knows who because you're seeing who's sending messages to whom on, on a person's wall, for example. And also, you know what people are experts at because they are talking about those kinds of issues or sharing articles about their own accomplishments, about other people having opinions. So we increase the level of association when we use ESM, which we didn't have when we were doing just private email messaging between individuals. We also increase the what is called as evaluability. That is our ability to evaluate other people's information because we see what is recommended, we see what comments people are putting, we see when people like something or dislike something, we see when people tag something. So again, that allows us, that helps us to evaluate the information. Third, it increases visibility because we see how people have responded to questions raised by others. So we begin to see things in a more social manner than what we were able to do previously. Then there is persistence. That is because this information is always being recorded, it doesn't matter when you came into it, you can see what the conversations were before that. And that is persistent there. You always have a chance to see it there. The, the last item on this particular list, and then there is another whole slide, is personalization. That is to include information, photos, and other content that uh, present personal identity. At the start of our discussion today, we had a conversation about my virtual background. 
I'm making a statement by that, by saying what it is that I'm using as a virtual background. Each of us are doing the same thing. Whether it's a virtual background or a real background, we are giving some presentation of self in everyday life. In, uh, in many of our communication classes, we may have been introduced to people, to uh, Irving Goffman, uh, where they talked about front stage and backstage. How do we choose to present ourselves? That's important. And that's a large part of what we're able to do here. If you go to the next slide, we see that there are five more, editability. That is, you have the ability to go back and revise information others provide after they have shared. So some of, the, some of our platforms allow us to go back and edit it. Uh, Twitter does not, Facebook does. So you can take a post in Facebook and you can go back and edit that. That's an example of editability. Pervasiveness, get responses to requests from others quickly so that you can put any comment you want and because people can access this on mobile platforms as well as uh, desktop platforms, it's, it's pervasive, it's everywhere. Wherever you are, you're able to access this information. It increases awareness because you're aware of the information and updates from others. When people tell you, so-and-so has defended their dissertation, so-and-so has won this top paper award, all of a sudden you become much more aware of what is happening. Searchability, so that if you wanna look for information and say, I think I saw something about this particular topic on social media, it becomes very easy to put search strings and get all top all the postings about a particular topic for example and then sharing of course we all know that we can create groups and channels on the fly for sharing information so we're not restricted to the standard formalized channels we can always make channels on the fly as we go along so this is all happening a lot recently in terms of technological affordances but if you recall in my title i talked also about the algorithmically infused changing nature of work so what do I mean about algorithmic affordances? We're only now beginning to see that in addition to the technological affordances that I spoke with you about in the last couple of slides, we are now also facing what we call, what I refer to as algorithmic affordances. That is, how is it that algorithms are helping change the way we do work? Notice that this cartoon says, so this software, does it tell you to do things? In other words, for a long time, we thought of technologies as tools, like our word processors. Then we thought about technologies as assistants, like we have Siri, like Alexa, like the Google Assistant, for example. All of these are examples of ways in which technologies assist us. But today we are on the brink of making technologies our peers. Um, we, I'm a part of a project that was uh, funded by the Army Research Lab, which talks about human augmented AI, oh sorry, um, human autonomous teaming. And human autonomous teaming is where you have as a teammate an autonomous agent. So the teammate is a robot or a uh, disembodied, but an autonomous agent. And they are contributing just like teammates with you. And then at the highest level, we are going even beyond that where the autonomous agent or the algorithm or the robot is not just a teammate, but may, but may well be your manager. That is, they are managing what you are doing by saying, you should work on this particular thing, Hana, you can work on that, Seongyi, you work on these things, and then you and then send it all to Eugene, and Eugene will, mer will merge all of these to make it a third uh, different term. So there, the manager is actually the autonomous agents or the algorithms where they find it. A very good example and cutting edge example of this work <clears throat> is uh, is being done by uh, friends of mine who are uh, at uh, one person by the name of Melissa Valentine, who's at Stanford Management Science and Engineering faculty member, and her collaborator, Michael Bernstein, who's in computer science also at Stanford. They have created algorithms that allow you to put together entire organizations on the fly. You simply say, I'd like to have a team or an organization that will help me create a website to publicize something. And it will literally put together, it'll find people, put them together, match them, assign tasks to them and stand up an organization. And they refer to this as a flash organization because it's done in a flash or a flash team that comes together really quickly. So these things are happening. And so as these things happen though, there's a lot that we don't know about how to make these kinds of, uh, uh, these kinds of affordances um, effective in the workplace and also the ethics associated with that. And so in the last uh, year, um, I've been um, part of two articles that have talked about these issues. One was published last year in Science Magazine, um, and it was about computational social science, the obstacles and the opportunity. 
and one that was published about four months ago, less than that, three months ago uh, in Nature. And the title of that article was Measuring Algor Algorithmically Infused Society. So this article in Nature was not just focusing on the workplace, it was focusing about how algorithms are infusing all of our societies. Uh, while today I'm gonna to be focusing more on the workplace. So what, what exactly, to make this more concrete, I thought it'd be useful to see an actual example of an algorithmic affordance that happens in the workplace. And that is in the notion of how we put teams together. A lot of work has been done in the field of communication and related fields on how to make teams effective at what they do. But much less has been done on how the teams are put together in the first place. And we know these matter. And so if you look at teams that you are in, that either you are part of, you'll find that they can be generally, they fall into a, to a, on a continuum where on the one hand, the bottom year, they are self-assembled teams. In academia, that happens a lot. We decide who we want to work with on a project. We decide who we want to uh, work with on submitting a proposal. And those are what I would call self-assembled teams. And many of us do that in that context. However, there are many times where teams are not self-assembled, but they are staffed. Think about classes that you have taken. Some professors may tell you, go ahead and form your own team. Others may tell you, no, I'm going to put you into team. Sometimes those teams could be put together randomly. Sometimes they may put together based on some criteria that they may have. Um, and then of course we have, oops, sorry. Uh, and then that's one continuum that we, one dimension that could be either, oh, sorry, why does this want to keep moving on to the next slide? So one dimension is the staffing and the self-assembly of teams, whether you form your own team or whether someone else forms the team and gives it to you. Um, an extreme example of staffed teams would be astronaut teams who are going to, on space missions. They don't self-assemble. It's not like two or three get together and say, hey, would you like to go to the moon with me or to go to the space station with me? Those are staffed by certain people, right? The other continuum that is much less studied, but it's again more irrelevant, is how do we do it, either when it is staffed or if it is self-assembled? Most of the time, what we see falls into the left category or the user search-driven category. So in this category, let me see if I can get my pointer to work. Yeah, so in this category, we basically search for people, right? We, when you think about the way you form teams, you like, okay, I think I need somebody who's good at this, or I need somebody who's good at that, or I want somebody who's a senior person, or a senior person may say, I want somebody who's a junior person who I can help um, you know, grow them and mentor them, for example. But now we are also beginning to see a little bit on this end of the continuum on the right-hand side which is the algorithmic formation tree. Think of this as an extension of something we already do in our social lives, namely online dating. So if you think of all that has happened recently in the online dating world, whether it's things like match.com or whether it's things like Tinder, you swipe left, you swipe right, and you are forming uh, online dates and sometimes uh, marriages and uh, serious relationships. If we can use algorithms to help us find online dates, why can't we use similar al algorithms to find not just dates, but also our teammates? If you're willing to find them uh, our social mates, why not also use the same idea to form our teammates? That's an example of where we are beginning to see the possibility of having algorithms help us in terms of formation of teams in the workplace. So I wanted to give you just one very con concrete example and and uh, we'll come back to this later on. So of course, I mean, I, I I'm going to I'm going to talk about the study much later on. But in the interest of just to make it concrete, we know from research that people form teams with others of the same gender. We know from research that people form teams with people who have high levels of skill on a particular issue. We know from prior research that people form teams with those who they have previously collaborated with. The wild card that we don't know is how does this recommendation from technology impact the ability to form teams? To put it very bluntly, if I see somebody at the top of search results in a recommendation result, am I indeed more likely for, them to, to, for me to invite them to be on my team? And look at this interaction effect that I have. If that recommendation is for somebody that I already previously knew, 
Will that make me much more likely or only somewhat more likely to form a team with that particular person? And you have to stay tuned because I have the answer to that question later on when I talk about empirical examples. Right now, I'm just giving you a broad uh, sort of theoretical uh, model, and then I'll come to some examples in the, if I have time, which I think I will. So then that brings us back to this broad title of today's talk, reimagining theories and methods to understand and enable the algorithmically infused change in nature of work. So I have now made an attempt to introduce you to what I mean by the algorithmically infused changing nature of work in terms of technological affordances, in terms of algorithms. So now let's see how we can reimagine theories. Well, to start with, we can reimagine theories because we now have the ability to test some of these theories at a scale that we could not do previously. So for example, we know in, the, in, the, in, in many areas that contagion is a very important aspect of social networks, right? So we know that people do things because they want to imitate other people. It's a very well-known fact. Um, and yet, until recently, all the results, all the studies that were done by people who study social networks, like myself, were done with relatively small data sets. But this article in 2017 says, you can take an existing data and theories, and now for the first time, we have, we have not been able to test it at scale until now. Now we are able to test it at scale. So this was an article that was published in Nature Communications in 2017, about four years ago. So you see how all this is happening quite recently. In this article, Sinan Aral and his collaborator, Nicolaitis, they looked at how we could understand the extent to which we exercise more or less based upon the exercise activity of those in our social network. So he got data from one of these Fitbit kinds of devices. And the data was basically looking at to what extent is your exercise activity tomorrow influenced or is contagious by the exercise activity of people in your social network. And at one level, what they found was quite boring. The answer was yes, the extent to which you exercise was influenced by a social network. But that was not the most exciting part of their study. What was really interesting is because they were able to study this at scale, they were able to actually find another insight that frankly, we had not seen before in the kind of data that we had collected in terms of theories of contagion. What was that finding? They found that you are more motivated to exercise if somebody in your social network is catching up on you. So in other words, it's like a race where you want to stay ahead of people behind you. So you look behind you and you say, oh, so-and-so is getting really close to me. I need to work a little harder. I need to do a little more exercise, which is different from what they didn't find. And that is they didn't find that you are more motivated to exercise to catch up with someone ahead of you. So the irony is that the contagion mechanism works in a very distinct fashion. It works to keep you ahead of the competition, not to catch up with the competition. And that's an interesting difference that was not looked at until now. So you begin to see how the, this is an example of how not only are we able to test theories at scale, but because of the scale, we now are able to come up with additional nuances, which we couldn't before. Another example of how we can reimagine theories with the kind of data we have now is to focus on new or at least increasingly prevalent phenomena. I've given you one already. Team assembly is an example of that phenomenon. Until recently, there was not much work done on team assembly. Most of the work was done on teams after they were formed. So the ability to study how we assemble teams, and we know that the assembly of teams in some ways is going to be very consequential because what you can do as a team is going to be entirely contingent on who you put in your team. So that's an example of a new phenomenon. Another new phenomenon that is very, very popular these days, some of you must have heard of it, is collective intelligence. Collective intelligence is based on a very basic premise, um, goes back to the popular book uh, called The Wisdom of Crowds. And yet there's a lot to be said about why sometimes that crowds are not as wise as you want them to be. And so again, Today, we are able to use these approaches to study theories about new concepts that are getting more popular, such as team assembly, such as collective intelligence. This was an article that was published 
uh, also quite recently called Optimal uh, Incentives for Collective Intelligence. Uh, another example is reimagining theories that invite consideration of new combinations of variables. And here the point basically is that most of our theories until now have been based upon the kind of data we collect. It's a well-known fact, which no one normally admits to it, but most theories that people put together are based upon variables that you can measure. And quite frankly, why would you write a theory or develop a theory that you're not able to test because you couldn't get the very, you couldn't measure the variables that you included in your theory. But today we are again changing that. If you see, for example, in the, again, I'm gonna come with examples from social networks because that's my area, my primary area of research. <clears throat> Until recently, no one thought about trying to explain our social networks based upon networks in our brain. Why? Because it was not easy to collect data on networks in the brain, but that has changed. And so Emily Falk, who is the lead, who's the last author with an anchor author on this article, She's a faculty member at the Annenberg School for Communication at the University of Pennsylvania. She and her team have now begun to think about theories of social network structure that tie our social networks to what is happening in terms of brain connectivity. So her research is showing that what, how we interact in our social networks, the ways we develop social networks are shaped by networks within the brain because she measures that. And guess what? The social networks in turn then shape the networks with the brain. So there's a mutual effect between brain networks and social networks. This whole area is now opening up new op opportunities, new combinations of variables that we've never looked at previously to help understand. Uh, and so that brings new theories with new combinations of variables. And hence, I look at that as an opportunity for reimagining theories. So far, we've talked about reimagining theories. The second part of it is reimagining data. So what are the kinds of data? First of all, obviously until recently, uh, we didn't have opportunities until to have, we studied large virtual data sets. So this is an example of some of the new data sets that we were involved in amongst the first in the field of communication. Uh, Scott Poole, who is at Illinois, Dimitri Williams, who is at USC. Uh, we collaborated with a computer scientist from Minnesota and, and, and folks at other universities, where we were beginning to look at large tracks of online games, massively multiplayer online games, because that gave us opportunities to study how people form teams in this game. Who do they interact with in these games? If you're not familiar with it, which I suspect most of you are probably familiar with it because you're living in the country that is known as the world capital when it comes to MMOs um, and um, so, you're probably more familiar than most other people, but these are games where you take on the role of an avatar and then you go, uh, go kill monsters and you earn wealth and sometimes you form teams because you can't do it by yourself. And so this was an outstanding opportunities to collect these kinds of data and to study it. Um, alongside that, we also had data from other platforms where people were unintentionally providing data. So things like uh, ESL, the kinds of uh, ESM platforms we talked about, Microsoft Teams. These were platforms where people were using it for interaction with one another, but in the process, they were generating data that could tell us a lot about the social networks that people have. And indeed, now the companies like Microsoft and Facebook have become very wise to it. So within the last few months, Microsoft, which now has Office 365, which owns Microsoft Teams, has created a separate enterprise within the Microsoft uh, company called Microsoft Viva. And what Microsoft Viva does is it takes the metadata from everything you do in Office 365 and uses it to help you understand yourself and your company and your networks and your organizations. Okay. So this is an example of Microsoft doing it Facebook is doing exactly the same thing with that workplace. They're also developing their own internal platforms as is Slack, which is now uh, owned by uh, Salesforce. And they're all looking at ways in which the data that is accidentally being generated or is being, they sometimes people call it digital exhaust or digital trace data. Data that is being generated unintended, provides an unintentional source of it. 
And Kaggle, which some of you may be familiar with, is yet another example of a platform that is supposed to be for competing on software. Uh, you know, you compete in, in sort of competitions about what kinds of uh, software uh, you're developing, but that also is now providing people insights. I've had students of mine who have looked at Kaggle.com data to be able to see how could you predict when someone, which team would win a prize, which team would get a high score in submission, who has played, who has been on which teams with whom. So it provides a lot of insights into team analytics, if you may, by simply taking the Kaggle data that is already publicly available. We are also getting data from new sources, data from sensors. Uh, I talked about neuro data, but we also have sociometric badges. So uh, Sandy Pentland at MIT has created these little badges that you can put on, that you can, uh, that you can wear. These are like wearable devices, and they provide you a lot of information that are very much like our iPhones do. It tells us about our activities, but it also tells us about other things that we can do. It does not actually record our audio, but it tells us enough about who we may be talking with at a particular time by doing something called capturing speech prosody, which is not recording audio, but is, is, is assessing um, amplitude and frequency. And from that is inferring when you're talking to somebody else. And using this technology, they published this article in HBR and in other places where they were able to show that managers could tell you uh, what they what, give you insights about teams and how effective teams would be by simply looking at the sociometric badge data and the metadata and by using that to predict which teams were likely to be more or less effective than other teams. Uh, we also can get data from neuro sources. As I said, in many cases, we don't have to put people into these tunnels. We are able to put skull caps, uh, a project that I'm working on right now with some colleagues at uh, at Cornell and Penn State, where we are just putting skull caps on individuals, very similar to what Emily uh, Falk and her team uh, have been doing at the University of Pennsylvania. In fact, the person we're working with at Penn State was a former postdoc with Emily at uh, Penn. And we are studying how we can understand these kinds of issues to be able to understand people's emotional reactions when they engage in teaming behavior. And then finally, there's also getting data intentionally from people, where people are now, and I'm sure this is true for many of you, you're collecting your data from places like Mechanical Turk, et cetera, and being able to collect uh, data in those cases. Uh, we, uh, at, at um, in the United States, we created a platform. This was a joint collaboration between Northeastern University, David Lazar's team there, University of Illinois, uh, and our team out here as part of uh, Army Research Lab funded project we created a website called volunteerscience.com, which is very similar where you volunteer your time and you can volunteer your data. And it is used by people who are trying to conduct experiments in this area. We ourselves at Northwestern have designed a platform that I'll talk a little bit more about called My Dream Team. So this is a platform that is very similar to match.com, except that it's not for online dating, it's to form teams. And the idea here is very simple. You, uh, you can go in there and put in your user profile and your characteristics, and then it provides you customized teammate recommendations based on search queries. The good news here for you is, as a potential user is classes are using this to be able to help self-assemble teams. Students and others can self-assemble into teams using something like this. The good news from our point of view is that we are able to collect data with your permission and with your consent on how you search, who you search for, what you search, who you invite, whose invitations you accept, whose invitations you decline. So we get more insight into the team assembly process in a way that we've never been able to do so far. And so it's a win-win for um, people who might want a tool like this to form teams and for researchers like myself who want to study this process. Uh, one last example here that I might be also able to give you is a website called wheresgeorge.com, which I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with it, but it was created as a joke. So somebody said, let's create a uh, website uh, called wheresgeorge.com. You can actually go to this website if you want to take a look at it. The George they're referring to here is the George Washington on the dollar bill. So the American US dollar bill has a photograph of, of uh, George Washington. And so what you can do here is somebody created this website and many times you will see a dollar bill with the stamp on it. Somebody is, has a stamp on it called go to wheresgeorge.com. And so if you get that dollar bill, you go to wheresgeorge.com, you put the, the serial number of the dollar bill, and it'll take you to a page 
which shows you where that dollar bill has been. And so you can say, if I get that dollar bill here in Evanston, I put Evanston, Illinois. And then of course, in the course of my transaction, I give that dollar bill to somebody who gives it to somebody who looks at it and says, oh, this says, where's yours.com? Let me go, go to that website. And they might say, oh, I, by now I'm in, um, in Iowa City. Uh, and so it could be anywhere. And so what happens, it was kind of a fun thing. But a colleague of mine here at Northwestern in applied mathematics, Dirk Brockman, he's now in Germany, uh, but he was my colleague here at Northwestern at the time. He thought this is a really interesting way to study mobility networks. Because if you are tracking where the dollar bill is, it means it moved with someone from one place to another place. So it's like I went, I had that dollar bill in my wallet in Evanston. I got on a flight and went to Washington, D.C., and I gave it as a tip at a restaurant there, which moved, which says basically I moved from Evanston to Washington, D.C. So Dirk Brockman took all of the data that was available, publicly available data on wheresjudge.com and built a mobility network for the entire United States and used it to predict the spread of the H1N1 virus back in 2009. And this was an article that was written up in the New York Times in 2009, predicting flu with the aid of George Washington. He, more recently, he's used the same mobility network, updated now, to be able to also help us understand and simulate the spread of COVID. So you can see how sometimes data comes in the most unintended places where people had come up with a joke idea for a website, and the next thing you know now, it's being used in very serious ways to help us combat the pandemic. Um, finally, people think of the lab as not being, a, they don't associate the lab with big data. People do experiments in lab where they put people into teams and they ask them to do, in my case, it's teams. But if you look at it, you know, we get a lot of data from small groups of people who are working on experiments in the lab. We get self-report data, what people feel. We also get self-report data, what people think, but we get server log, what people see and do. So if they're doing something on a server, we have timestamp data, what they did, when, when they clicked on something, when they pointed on something, et cetera. We have chat log data, what people say. So very soon, you're actually getting a lot of big data in the lab from small teams. And so we wrote an article in, uh, that was published um, in, in IO Psychology in 2015, which was titled, Little Teams, Big Data. Big data provides new opportunities for teams theory. So again, all of this to say that we can think about this, we can reimagine big data, but why stop at big data? We can also reimagine broad data. My friend, Jim Hendler, who is a professor in computer science at Ranzala Polytechnic Institute of RPI, he, he had this article where he said in 2013, he said the era of big data is so 2012 enter the era of broad data. And what does he mean by broad data? By broad data, he means combining different kinds of data. And the juxtaposition is not just getting lots and lots of data of one kind, but the broad data means you combine different types of data and put them together. So this is the move from big data to broad data, where we take different types of data, collate them together, and that's what gives the opportunity for people to move from big data to broad data. Having now talked about reimagining theory and data, I want next to focus on reimagining methods. And again, here my examples will come from networks because that's the area that I'm most familiar with. Until recently, when people talked about dynamic networks, they talked about measuring a network at one point in time, and then measuring a network as a second point in time, and then again as a third point in time. But now, because we have data that comes timestamped, timestamped data is a completely different animal. I can, I can still recall, as though it were yesterday, that when I first got access to some of that massively multiplayer online games data that I was telling you, virtual worlds data, and I was trying to study the networks amongst the players in the game, I did something very silly. We had timestamped data. We knew exactly at any one point in time which participant sent a message to which other participant, which person sent a friend request to which person, which person bought something from another person. These are different kinds of actions, interactions, and transactions. What did I do? I took the data for the month of January, for example, 
And I collapsed it to create one network and I called that the January Gaming Network. And then I took all the data from February and I collapsed it and I called it the February Gaming Network. Same thing for March and April. And then I wanted to study the dynamics of this network. Why did I do that? Because at the time, the only methods available to analyze longitudinal networks assume that you had a network at time one, a network at time two, a network at time three. But that's crazy because I was losing all the data that I had at each timestamp by collapsing the data into this arbitrary month of January or February or March. And I mentioned that to some of the people in, in the social network space, I said, you know, it's really a shame that I'm doing this. And they go, you know what? We need to think about new. And so the person who was the leader of developing these time one, time two, time three networks, Tom Snyders, who was a researcher at the University of Groningen in the Netherlands and also at Oxford, I remember walking with him by one of the canals uh, near his home in the Netherlands and and I told him my dilemma and he goes, we need to, now we need to have new methods to handle this data. We don't have methods simply because we didn't have this kind of data. But now that we have this kind of timestamp data, we need to create methods. So this to me is a perfect example of new data being the proverbial tail that wagged the dog. Because the data was available, now we needed methods to analyze the data. Until now, we didn't have methods because no one had that kind of data. Why device? methods for data we didn't have. And so that whole idea gave rise to this area called relational event modeling, where we said networks are not static pictures, but we are actually can model it as a, a relational event, where the relational event is given as actor A sending something to actor B at timestamp T. And everything that is a timestamp data can be looked at as relational events. And so in 2016, we wrote this article, um, uh, two articles that, we, that, uh, that you see out here, uh, a lot of focusing on how we can use this to analyze group interaction processes, understanding team processes as relational event networks. And this just took off. Uh, in the social networks conferences in 2015, 2016, so we're talking about five years ago, there were two or three sessions on relational event models in the entire conference social networks conference. This year, there were about 60 sessions on just relational event models. That shows you how much this has dramatically changed because now we have so much of timestamp data that's available to analyze it. Another example is hypergraphs. So most of the time when people study teams as networks, they say if three people are in a team, I will just throw a line between them. But that loses the ability to see how can I look at a team where I want to distinguish between a team made up of three people and maybe three teams made up of pairs of those same three people. And so now we are creating what is called as hypergraphs, where in a normal network, you have an edge that connects two nodes. But in hypergraphs, you have a hyper edge that doesn't need to connect just two nodes. It can connect as many nodes as you want. So if you look at it here, E1 is a hyper edge and it involves three people. So V1, V2 and V3 are three people who belong to a team that I'm calling E1. E2 is a hyper edge, which is basically a team of two people, V2 and V3. E3 is another hyper edge, which is made up of three people, V3, V5 and V6. E4 is a team of a single person, V4. And V7 is a person, but he's not in any team because he didn't write any articles. If you think of this as people writing articles, for example. So these are new approaches that we are now beginning to see that are coming into play. Uh, and this was an article that we wrote back in 2015 that again shows you how we are able to look at, as we have stayed on so many teams in so many different ways, which we didn't have before, we now have new methods to be able to handle it. Finally, we also have computational modeling, simulations as ways of studying it. I might be able to show you an example of this, but now instead of just studying data from in observed teams, we can simulate what teams would be doing. We can simulate the ability to look at teams and to see how we can make weather forecasting. Just like we do weather forecasting where we simulate models to see what the weather will look like tomorrow. 
we now have the ability to simulate what teams would look like tomorrow. These links represent who gets along with someone, a positive affect. This one on the right-hand side is negative affect, says this person doesn't get along with this person. It could be behavioral, who works well with whom, who's willing to share information with whom. And we can make predictions about who's likely to do well on teams together over a period of time that also dynamically changes. And as we will see in a later example, we can not only predict it, but we can also modify it. So unlike the weather where we can't change the weather, in this case, we can say, what can we do to change a, a dynamic of a relationship where two people are not doing well? Can we do something to make it different? And then finally, I would say that we have also reached a point in our field where when I took my research methods class as a graduate student, I was told to stay away from what is called as dust bowl empiricism, where you can just put a lot of variables in there and something will come to be significant. Uh, and everything at the time was taught to us as being very much driven by what we would call things like deductive logic, for example. Um, today, I think that we have to revisit that. Because we have so much of data available, we have the ability to do exploratory analysis. We have the ability to look at machine learning and combine that with deductive work. So instead of just doing deductive or inductive, we have an opportunity to look at how machine learning might give us new ways of thinking about relationships that are linear methods that we have done so far may not be able to capture. And frankly, change the ways we think about hypotheses. Because if you think about classifier systems that are one example of machine learning, they might suggest hypotheses that are very different from anything we've thought about. For example, machine learning algorithms today that are classifier systems, these are very standard things, uh, are often put together in what are called as Boolean logics or classifier tree algorithms, where it says, in order to predict whether someone survived or died, I might start out by saying, is that person's sex male or female? And say, if it is not male, then the survival rate was so much. If it is, if it is male, then we can ask ourselves, is that person's age greater than 9.5 or not? If it is less, then you know what percentage of people died. If it is more, you begin to see this. Then you look at, at the, the spouse or siblings that are abroad, okay? is the number of spouses or siblings that are abroad. And again, we look at that and we can come up with whether somebody will survive or not. So if I look at this, this doesn't look like any kind of standard hypothesis that we think about in the social sciences. We, in our social sciences, we think of hypotheses as, you know, sort of differences between A and B or positive correlations between X and Y. We don't think of hypotheses as Boolean logic statements of if then statements. And so one of the things that this allows us to do now is reimagine how we think of hypotheses because it, we now have a new language in which we can think about the ways in which we are making predictions and explanations about phenomena that we study. And then finally, what I would ask you to think about is that you know we have a criticism that is made in, uh, in our field that we tend to look uh, for explanations and we tend to look for things under the lamppost. Some of you may have seen this cartoon, but it's basically a drunken man is crawling around on his hands and knees under a lamppost. And um, he's asked, what is he doing there? And someone says, what are you doing? And he goes, oh, I'm looking for the keys to my car. I lost the keys to my car and um, I'm trying to find it. And uh, the guy says, well, do you think you lost it here underneath the, the lamppost? Why is it that you're looking here? He goes, oh, no, no, I'm, I don't know where I lost it, but this is the only place where there is light. So that's where I'm going to look for it. And so the assumption is that sometimes we look uh, at phenomena simply because that's where the data is. A lot of the criticism that is made about studying Twitter, for example, is that people study Twitter because that's where the data is. It's one of the few places that gives us API access. And so we are going to study it. And so sometimes I've gone to social media conferences. I suspect many of you have been to them where they say that, are we really studying about social media or are we studying for a very special science that we may call Twitterology, where all we are doing is more and more about Twitter. And in fact, the incoming new editor for the Journal of Computer Media Communication, Nicole Ellison, has made it one of her highlights is to focus on to what extent are we able to make uh, claims and inferences and insights 
that are not platform specific, that cut across different platforms for exactly this reason. But I would like to add to that, that while there has been a criticism that we are looking under the lamppost mostly for data, I believe we also actually have the same problem in theories. If we look at it, we learn certain theories in graduate school, right? And then we go, we go out of our way to try to see if whatever phenomena we are studying is going to fit one of the theories we learned in grad school. In other words, we're doing the same thing. We are like the drunken person who's crawling around on our hands and knees under the theoretical lampposts that has been given to us rather than going for new approaches. And I think one of the things as part of reimagining theories is not being confined to existing theories, but being willing to be to, you know, to break out of that mold and look for new approaches and new theories because we are able to look at it in this case. So that, that's the part of the talk that I wanted to give you, which is more broad. Now, let me get, turn to some very tangible examples in our own work where we touch upon these examples. And one of the areas that I worked uh, a lot recently uh, is in trying to understand, as we've talked about, how networks can be used in the workplace. Um, that got a new name recently. In 2013, people began to call HR as people analytics. In particular, this was an article uh, that was titled how Google is using people analytics, a label that it popularized to completely reinvent HR. And so this was an article, uh, this was an article in the New York Times, which was published in 2016, which says what Google learned from its quest to build the perfect team. They spent two years studying 180 teams, the most successful ones shared five traits. What were the five traits? The number one trait was psychological safety. If on your team, everyone felt they had psychological safety, meaning team members feel safe to take risks and be vulnerable in front of each other. If members in your team had that, then everyone is going to be, that team was likely to be very successful. And then they had other things, dependability, structure and clarity, meaning and impact. But all of these qualities that, we, that they identified were all individual qualities of people or individual attributes of people like psychological safety, people's perceptions of how psychologically safe they were. My colleague, Paul Leonardi, who was my colleague at the time, who was my colleague at Northwestern and is now at Santa Barbara, he and I wanted to make a case that people analytics is not being well served if it stays just by looking at individual attributes. So we published this article in 2018, said uh, better people analytics measure who they know, not just who they are and who they know is the networks part of it. And so we may say that most people who are looking at people analytics are focusing on individual trade, individual state data, but we need to look not only at the attributes, but also the relations, individuals network data, team network data, organization network data. And our argument was that just like in, in people who are studying uh, the brain have been able to identify how neuroimaging tells us the difference between the brain or the activity in the frontal cortex of a healthy human being, which we call the control case, and the, how it looks different in the case of somebody who's suffering from schizophrenia, that we actually have the ability to do the same thing by looking at the networks within an organization, the individual networks, the team networks, and so on. And in our case, we're not, we're not thinking of this as a microscope, which is what was used to generate these images, but in fact, what we need is the opposite. We need a macroscope. So if you look at this image, you don't see very much. But if you start zooming out, lo and behold, you see the image. So this, of course, is a very classic Henri Matisse uh, pointillism example. But the key here is that if you can zoom out enough to see the forest from the trees, you begin to see certain patterns that give you insights about the organization. We couldn't do this easily in the past, even though social networks have been around as a field for a long time, mainly because it was difficult to get social network data at scale. Because in the past, it was typically collected by surveys and surveys get outdated and many people don't answer them and so on. But today, thanks to the kind of digital trace data we get from these platforms that I was telling you about, things like Microsoft Teams, 
and Slack and Zoom and so on, we have the opportunity to ask ourselves, could we actually get social network data to better understand organizations by simply looking at the digital traces of who messages whom, how quickly people reply to one another's messages, who at mentions whom, who likes whose comments, and use that to predict what people would have said on a survey if they had answered a survey. And that was one of the first things we did. We looked at some of these platforms and we looked at digital trace data. And we only know this is going to get more and more important in the years ahead. This was a prediction made by Gartner before the pandemic. These predictions have already been met because of the pandemic and our increased use of this. And so we take this activity data, what employees are doing, who they message, who they send files to, who they send badges to, who they like, who they send email messages to. We take all these data and we try to decipher the structural signatures within the network. And in the HBR article, we talk about six of these signatures. Well-established in social networks research, nothing novel about this. The only thing novel is that we are now able to potentially use the digital trace data to be able to look at this. The first signature is called the ideation signature. If we see a signature where the person in purple is connecting to people who are not connected to each other, as you can see in this diagram, that tells us that this person is very likely to come up with good ideas because a person comes up with good ideas when they talk to people who don't talk to each other because now they are uniquely positioned to take these different people's ideas and combine them together to come up with some novel idea. This one is called the influence signature. This person is influential, not because they connect to a lot of people, the orange person connects to a lot more, but this person connects to people who connects to a lot of people who connects to a lot of people who connects to a lot of people. Some of you may recognize that this is very similar to what Google uses in the page rank algorithms. The top search result in Google is essentially using a social network metric called the eigenvector. The page rank algorithm says that the search result at the top is not the website that has the links to it from the most other web pages, but has links to it from pages that have links to it from the most other pages and those pages have links to it from the most other pages. That's called the influence signature. And by looking at it, you can see who would be influential in the organization. Then we move from the individual to the team. If a team has people who have lots of links to each other, that team is going to be efficient, which means they'll get something done quickly. Not necessarily that they will do a great job at it, but they will get it done to the extent we have the joke, right? A, a, a done dissertation is a good dissertation. This, this team will get their projects done. A done project is a good project. If you want a project team to be innovative, then you need to look for the signature at the bottom left corner, where it's not only important for people in the team to have connections to each other, but the team is innovative because each member on the team connects to people on the outside who are not connected together. So what they are doing is they are bringing in from their various communication networks, new ideas into the team, and that will make this team innovate. And then finally, with the last two signatures are at the organizational level, which says that in this particular context, you see there's a silo. People in these departments are all talking amongst their, within their own departments, but they're not connecting to people from others. And then finally, we have the vulnerability signature. That is a person on the outside from the organization who's connecting to a lot of people inside the organization, but these people who they are connecting with are not talking to each other. That means the organization becomes vulnerable to somebody from the outside. A person on the outside is talking to somebody in baby care, is talking to somebody, uh, so it's a, a company I'm thinking of is Procter & Gamble. They talk to somebody in baby care, they talk to somebody in uh, beverages, they talk to somebody um, in hair care. And they may now have some ideas of things that they could be doing that people in Procter & Gamble are not able to do because they're not talking to each other. And I give this as a very specific example because of a project I did with Procter & Gamble where they found examples of people on the outside who they were vulnerable to. At the very least, these people will double, triple build them for the same thing. At the worst, this person can come up with an idea that PNG should have come up with if people inside the organization had been talking to each other. So now what I'm going to give you is examples of how this kind of data that you have can be good because it can increase diversity and inclusion, 
succession planning and post-merger integration. It can increase diversity and inclusion because what happens is that people are now able to, diversity is something we're all studying a lot. You know, we can get a demographic thing that says, I have so much of the diversity in demographics, I have so much diversity in age and ethnicity, um, in any dimension you want. Inclusion is more difficult because we know that just putting diverse people on a team or on a committee or on a task force doesn't guarantee that people listen to them or that people are engaging with them. The joke is, you know, a woman might say something and all the four men in the room ignore what she says. And then a man five minutes later says exactly the same thing that the woman said. And all of a sudden, all the men go, oh my God, that's a wonderful idea. Networks allow us to look at that inclusion factor because it allows us to see who is engaging, who is replying to whom, who's talking to whom. So it's not just who is in the room, but how are people interacting with that person? That's where the inclusion part comes in. Succession planning. Today, when we look at how to uh, find a successor to somebody for a job in a company, we look at their resumes and we tacitly say, oh yeah, but this person knows X, Y, and Z. One of the activities that I've developed uh, here is an activity where I ask people, I, I give them resumes, I give them a case and I say, tell me who do you think should be the successor uh, in this new role for somebody who's a legal counsel for the company. And they come up with a recommendation and, and a justification. And then I show them the network maps of everyone in the organization. And I say, now go back and revisit it. Look at these network maps and tell me whether you've changed your mind or whether you think that you made the right choice. And they'll often change their mind. They go, oh, I didn't see. This person has these kinds of networks. That would be really helpful, for example. And then finally, post-merger integrations. A lot of money has been spent around the world on mergers and acquisitions, two companies that are coming together. But unfortunately, we also know that billions of dollars are wasted because most M&As are not successful. Networks have the ability to be able to map who are the influential people in the two organizations that are either merging or one acquiring the other, and then help identify who are the right people who should be connecting across these organizational boundaries to make that transition less uh, disruptive than it might be in other situations. These are all examples of research that is ongoing that I'm not going to give you anything more about, but for these next examples, I'm going to show you based on our own work, what we have found. That is, how can we make relational analytics actionable for teams? So in self-assembly, in team staffing, I've already touched on it, in team competition and team conflict. I'm going to run through these very quickly and, and wrap up my presentation uh, shortly thereafter. So the first one, what if we could have survey data at minimal cost with 100% response rate updated 24 seven, which we don't normally have because surveys take a long time, they elicit low response rates and they get rapidly obsolete. So our first project that we did was we actually collected data. This is data that we collected in, in, uh, in, in China. And we asked ourselves the question, can we take this digital trace data that could be a combination of at mentions, who sent messages to whom, who liked messages from whom, who posted on the wall, who sent a direct message? Can we take all of that and use it to predict what people would say on a survey without having them take the survey? But of course, in order to test this, we actually collected data from 60, in this particular example, 66 employees at a Chinese company that used an ESM platform. It was not Slack, but it was a lot like Slack. This is what it looked like. And then what we did was, uh, so the company was called Joywalk. And then, uh, sorry, the platform was called Joywalk. It was made by a company called Dogesoft. And we took their data, we took digital trace data from them for this period of time. This is 2019, pre-COVID. And then we also had them answer a survey about questions. And our goal was to see, could we train a, a model, a machine learning model or a statistical model to take their digital trace data and predict what they would have said in a survey. So the survey data were questions like, which is standard in social network analysis. This person provides me a sense of person. Who do you rely on for leadership? Who do you go for help or advice at work? And we used exponential random graph models, which is a statistical technique to be able to see if we could predict from the digital trace data, what they said on the survey. And what we found was in fact, that we were able to do that. So if we took this question, this person provides me with a sense of purpose, employees who send someone one message per day are 15.2% more likely to say that person provides them with a sense of purpose. 
If someone sends 10% more messages than they receive from another person, they're 26.7 times more likely to say that that person provides them with a sense of person sense of purpose. So we built all these models, we repeated this for different types of networks, advice seeking networks, leadership networks. And basically, we then were able to see that we could do a pretty good job of predicting just based on the digital trace data what they will answer on a survey, which is very powerful, because now we don't have to ask them to do surveys. Once we have a model, we can take the digital trace data and imagine what that survey would what what they would have said on a survey directly from that. So we use that to build a relational analytics dashboard, a prototype which basically says at the back end, it takes the digital trace data, it runs our statistical models, and at the front end, it tells you what that social network looks like in the organization as though people were answering the survey question about social networks every single day because we could update this based on what was happening in the back and we could learn about employees. Um, we could come up with all those signatures. In other words, how likely is someone to resign? How likely is someone to come up with good ideas? How likely is someone to be influential? Um, this is the influence network. So we had a whole series of different uh, metrics, the ones that I showed you on that uh, HBR article that we were able to compute based not on actual survey data, but predicted survey data based on what people were doing in the enterprise social media. And we know that these values are fairly valid because uh, we trained the model and we found that the model was pretty good in terms of being able to predict it. Anyway, I'm going to just skip through these slides here and then say, now that we know that we can predict survey, now let's see what we can do to understand how teams are assembling better. So we all know that in some cases, teams do really well and we call those dream teams and everyone is really happy. But we also know that many times we are in what we would call nightmare teams where people don't get along well. And if I ask for a show of hands, uh, as I would do in an in-person presentation, I would get, I say, how many of you have been on a dream team? And we get a few people's hands up. And we ask how many people have been on a nightmare team? And we get three times that many hands up of people who've been on a nightmare team. And so our goal was to understand how do teams assemble and how do they become dream teams? So this is work that was done with my former student, Marlon Twyman, who's in the faculty at Annenberg USC. My now former student, as of tomorrow, Diego Gomezara, who defended his dissertation um, the earlier, the, I mean, late last week, and is going to start a postdoc at Kellogg uh, day after tomorrow on the 1st of September. And my former student, Jackie Young, uh, who is doing a postdoc at Harvard Business School. So this was a study where we tried to understand exactly that question that I was asking you earlier. How do we form teams with an algorithmically infused recommender system? So team assembly is you search for people and then you invite someone and then people respond to it. And we wanted to study the invitation network. What explains why A is going to invite B? That's a very simple question. And we go back to some of the things that we talked about earlier. Um, we studied this using data from uh, people who were designing teams in a classroom setting, but the projects were interesting because the teams were across two universities and across two different disciplines. So these classes were jointly taught by an environmental ecology uh, instructor and a social psychology instructor. And each team was required to have members from each of the two universities. And the goal of the project was the team was supposed to come up with an advertising campaign to mitigate an environmental sustainability issue. Participants assembled into teams over the course of one week using the technology platform, My Dream Team, and we collected data in two samples. In the first sample, we had 213 participants that formed 32 teams. In the second, we had 197 participants that formed 31 teams. So we, we used the platform that I said we developed here at Northwestern. People were first asked to respond to personal surveys about their own profile, and then they can start putting, stating who they want on their team. And then they were given recommendations based on the algorithms, and they could start sending invitations to people. And so the question was, who invited whom to a team? So the network here was, the network was, why is it that A invited B to a team? We don't worry, right now, we're not asking the question whether their invitation was accepted or not, simply, who did you invite? And going back to the, the formula, to this graphic that I showed you very early on, and we found that just as we expected, people invited others who were highly skilled, we found that people invited others of the same gender. We found that people invited others 
uh, with whom they had previously worked because they are familiar with those people. And we found that people who were high on recommendations were also more likely. So people, if, if, they were, if the person's name was in the top 10 recommendation list, you were more likely to invite that person in both the samples that we studied. If you had previously collaborated with a person, you're more likely to invite that person. The interesting finding was the interaction term. That is, how likely are you to invite somebody if they had previously collab if, if you had previously collaborated with them and their name showed up on the top 10 recommendation? And this interaction was a negative effect, which basically means that if somebody is on the right, on the, the blue ones here is the recommendation was not in the top 10 or if a person showed up on the top 10. And what you see here is that if, if the blue is saying that you did not previously collaborate, what that basically means is if you did not previously collaborate with someone, the recommendation dramatically increased the likelihood that you would invite that person. If you did previously collaborate with that person, that's the red one, you would, in the absence of a recommendation, more likely to invite that person. But if that person did show up on the top 10 list, while you would increase the likelihood that you would invite that person, that increase is not as dramatic as it would have been for a person who you did not previously collaborate with. What this basically means is you are likely, you're less likely to rely on the recommendation for somebody that you knew already as compared to somebody that you did not know. Because once you know somebody, the recommendation is helpful, but not going to be as influential as if it was for somebody you didn't know. We applied that in the second case. Again, in the interest of time, I'm gonna take you into space for the next one. This is work being done by my current student, Brennan Anton, who is a PhD student here at Northwestern, and Alina, who's my former student and now my current colleague, who's at the faculty at Northwestern as a research assistant professor. And then also with Jackie Young from Harvard Business School, uh, postdoc there, former student of mine, Suzanne, who's my uh, collaborator, who is now at DePaul and also at NASA, and then uh, Leslie DeChurch, who's another collaborator of mine, who is the um, current chair of the Department of Communication here at uh, Northwestern. And so humans, if you didn't know, are going to become an interplanetary species. We're going to go to Mars by 2023. Uh, NASA is certainly planning on it. Just to give you an idea, the International Space Station is 250 miles above the Earth. The moon is 250,000 miles and, international, and Mars is 250 million miles uh, away. So you see that there's an order of magnitude a thousand times between space station and moon and a thousand times between moon and Mars. If we are gonna go to Mars, it's gonna take us a long time to get there. Why? Because the way the orbital dynamics are the first time, there are only small windows by when we can send out, send out a, a, satellite, a space station that leaves Earth and quickly arrives at Mars. And the same thing on the return. So there are small windows where we can send these out. And more importantly, it's gonna take about nine months to get there. We have to spend a year there before we get that window to come back quickly in nine months back to Earth. And while we are there, there could be as much as 22 minutes of a difference in time because of the speed of light and the signal strength it'll take from Earth to send something to Mars. And so the old idea of Houston, we have a problem from the moon coming, that message coming quickly is no longer going to be a luxury for people who go to Mars. They have to be able to be much more autonomous in the way they're going to do things. And so finding the right team to go to Mars in international crew, it's going to be crazy to find people who are going to be for three years together. There's no voluntary way of getting out of it. So how do we find the right team to be able to do this kind of mission? In the past, when people went on hazardous missions to Antarctica, we found that the people who wanted to go were, were people who had who were deficient in social skills. And these were people who were like, uh, you know, like, okay, you know, I, I don't really have a social life in uh, a year, so I might as well just go to Antarctica. Maybe I'll get lucky. Maybe it'll be dangerous. Who knows? And so the kinds of people who went to Antarctica are not the kinds of people who we are sending to the space station or who we will be spending to Mars. So there was a study that was done uh, looking at how do we decide what are the key issues of the personalities associated with people who are gonna get along if we were to go to Mars. We took that idea and others have talked about it. Captain Scott Kelly who, Kelly, who spent more time than most on the space station came back and said, teamwork makes the dream work at NASA. 
Uh, so our question was, what happens to teamwork under extended periods of time of isolation and confinement? And wouldn't it be nice to have a human Petri dish where we could study what happens to these people and imagine if we could put people, manipulate people's isolation and sensory depression for hundreds of days, making them do complex and boring tasks, monitoring them 24 seven. Some might say IRB or Institutional Review Board will never allow this, but actually that's exactly what we are doing because facilities like the United USA, the NASA has a facility called the Human Exploration Research Analog. This is located at the Johnson Space Center and they put people into this for 45 days, now they're in, in and even longer and we get to psychologically and physiologically poke and prod them every day making them do things we want them to do seeing what they are doing observing them making them answer our surveys collecting bio data from them and we're not alone the chinese have a similar facility they call it the chinese lunar palace the russians have a facility called nek we've collected data there uh, because the uh, nasa and uh, russian roscosmos we collaborate and so we've collected data there from a crew of six people who were there for 120 days. And now later this, uh, in two months, we are collecting new data where they're putting people there for 240 days in isolation. And we get to collect data from them. The Japanese have their own isolation chamber. The Europeans have their own things. There are private foundations. And we wanted to collect data like this, where we asked them, who do you work with effectively? And notice that they are green arrows where each astronaut tells us who they think they work effectively with. We also ask them the question, who makes tasks difficult to complete? And notice here the poor person at the bottom. Everyone is saying that this person at the bottom makes tasks, they makes their tasks difficult to complete. But this person is blissfully ignorant about it and doesn't report anyone else making their tasks difficult to complete. So the question for us is, could we have predicted that this person, there's one person on the team that everyone is going to gang up against and saying that this person makes their task difficult to complete. And could we have predicted this upfront? And the answer is we built a theoretical model. We used computer simulation with real data that we got from that to fit the model. And we were able to then make a prediction on this. Now, this because I'm, I don't think I'm logged in here. Let's see if this works. There we go. So we did a computer simulation. We used a platform called NetLogo, where we took real data and we saw what are the variables that were predicting whether somebody was going to get along with somebody else. And this was the kind of computational model we did, which we were very successful at doing. And so then we were able to say, for example, that every variable that we put into the model told us things like self-monitoring. So a person who was good at self-monitoring was more likely to be seen as, as someone that others enjoyed working with and was less likely to be seen as a hindrance. So there were lots of variables that went into this model. I don't want to go into detail. The bottom line is, and this is really quite stunning, that when we took these models, we, did, we ran it on a training data set, we ran it then on a test data set, and our prediction accuracy was quite remarkable. It was 0 0.766, 0 0.711. The precision and recall for those who are familiar with that from machine learning was also quite good with an F1 score of 0.8. Bottom line is we were able to take data initially about these people, their personalities, their demographics, and then based on what activities they were given, we could simulate exactly who was going to get along and not get along with someone for an entire 30 day, 45 day mission. We did this with different missions. We got better at it over a period of time. And then NASA, uh, was so happy with our prediction model that they asked us, can you now repair relationships? So it's not enough to tell us that A and B are not going to get along. Can you fix it? And what we did was we took the tasks that they were told. We said, OK, based on our prediction right before the mission started, we think X and Y are not going to get along on day 20. And so they said, OK, how do we fix that? Well, right now you have X and Y working on tasks together. We think they need a cooling off period. So we didn't want to pair them together on a task. So we repaired them with other people for a short period of time so that it would cool off. And we hoped that repairing them with other people would, and here comes a funny pun, would repair their relationships. So we're, we were repairing people in order to repair their relationships. I was very proud of that, of that uh, thing myself. Very quickly to wrap up here, could we predict team performance? In this, we went to sports. We wrote this article uh, that was published in Nature Human Behavior uh, a few years ago, a couple of years ago. And in it, we what we wanted to ask was, started out with an interest in cricket. I know that none of you are probably interested in this, but in India, 
uh, cricket is a very big thing. And what we wanted to do was to see to what extent could we predict whether team A will beat team B, not just based on the individual performance statistics of the people, but their relationships with each other. In the interest of time, all I would say here is that we found that in cricket, as well as in NBA data that we got, basketball association data from the US, soccer, the English Premier League, uh, Major League Baseball, as well as an online game called Dota 2, we found that in all of these cases, we were able to predict which team would beat the other team much more by whether these people had played together previously in a successful context, whether it was in the same team or some other team, much more so than just based on the individual statistics of the players. And we found in every single one of these cases, the networks of people playing together was more important than the individual statistics of these people. And so that provided us another way of predicting performance in teams across these cases. So again, individual brilliance played very modest impacts in the outcome of a cricket match. Prior relations in team victories between players has a much more significant effect on the outcome. And then to wrap it up here, we also wanted to see whether we could predict team conflict in teams. And again, we looked at networks, but here we go back into space. This is work that was done by my former postdoc, Michael Schultz, who's now a professor of sociology at Indiana University. And Michael was very interested in a particular phenomenon in space that most of you have probably not heard of. I'm just in the interest of time, I'm gonna jump ahead to the empirical example. It's called Skylab. Skylab was a set of missions, was in fact the United States first space station that no one has heard of in this current generation. It was after the Apollo mission and before the space shuttle. And there were three manned missions called Skylab 2, 3, and 4. Skylab 1 was, uh, uh, just a, a non-manned mission that was sent up to set up the Skylab there. <clears throat> and there were three manned missions. Um, each of them had a commander, a pilot, and a scientist pilot. The first one spent 28 days in space. They did a bunch of things. The second one spent 59 days, and they did a bunch of things. The interesting one was the third mission, the final mission, that was there for 84 days in space. And they had a lot of tension with mission control resulting in what is sometimes called a mutiny in space. Yes, they went on strike. Here's an article. Astronauts went on strike in space to get the weekends off. The commander of the mission said, we would never work 16 hours a day for 84 straight days on the ground, and we should not be expected to do it here in space. Wikipedia has an entry called the Skylab Mutiny. Harvard Business School did a case study called the Strike in Space. So what was wrong here. Why could, could we have predicted that this mission was going so wrong that they would go on a strike in space? Michael took all of the data that was available, two channels of air to ground communication, because all of that is public domain, 15,000 pages of spoken communication, 3,800 tapes, did the timestamp of every speaker, what they said, did topic modeling, from it found which actors talked about which topics, in what configurations, so they looked at the mental models of each actor, then they compared the mental models of different actors by seeing an actor will have a link with somebody else if they had similar mental models. And then they combined the mental models of the three crew members and those of the mission control. That's what is called as crew CC. And what they basically found was that Skylab 3, the one that had the problem, they had the least crew similarity mental models and the least mental model similarity with um, Capcom, the mission control back as compared to Skylab one and two. And in fact, that if you look at it over time, by day 35, we could have predicted what happened on day 46, that this particular Skylab three, you notice that their mental models were very far apart as compared to Skylab one and Skylab two, which didn't have any strikes. So bottom line here to wrap it up, the subject in this article that we wrote about uh, algorithmically infused that I will recommend that you take a look at, that Claudia Wagner was the lead author on that we published a couple of months ago, the subject of investigation has changed for social science. We, need, we are witnessing the emergence of algorithmically infused societies. The scale at which measurements can be applied is new and the granularity of what can be measured. Consequently, it is challenging, but important to identify, quantify, and rectify consequences of measurements and the challenges of measuring algorithmically infused societies in future research directions. 
need to we need, first we recognize we don't have established quality standards we don't have computational methods that make assumption that make the the assumptions explicit and and also the data sets that are used to develop and evaluate these models uh, the way we address this is by triangulating data to examine the measurement quality and developing guidelines um, we have to be careful about the consequences of mismeasurement a lot of what i've talked about would raise issues of ethics how do I know that I've got the survey predictions correctly? What if people are using WhatsApp rather than, uh, or using WeChat, for example, rather than the official channel? Uh, and so we have to think about the ethical reflections in empirical studies uh, and the participatory approaches. How can we involve them in these studies, involve our participants in these studies to develop a more consequence? And then finally, what I started out, social science theories were often not developed with the deep social uh, uh societal reach of algorithms and so this is making us think about whether we can really have social theories where algorithms are constantly changing what we do and observing what we do etc so again here we have to think about new ways of um, integrating data and measurement into the theory construction process and establishing more transparent prospective and participatory processes for examining these societies i thank you all so much i know i didn't leave any time for questions i'm, I'm certainly <laughs> available here Penny, if you want to answer it, uh, if you if you have any questions for me, but if you have to leave, I know it's at the bottom of the hour, so I thank you again for your time, and I will stop.